Hey everyone, Doc T here again. Thank you for joining me for another podcast from the Horses Advocate Radio. Helping horses thrive in a human world is something that we try to achieve one step at a time, and I appreciate you taking the time to be here. Today, I want to talk about protein. Protein is one of the most misunderstood elements of nutrition that everyone runs away from, uh, screaming, covering their ears because they don't want to hear about it. Every barn I go to, with maybe one or two exceptions, when I ask what are some of the nutrients that go inside a horse, uh, with a little encouragement, they'll come up with fats, and then they'll say sugar, and then they'll say carbohydrates, and then they'll say starch, which are all the same. Uh, some of it will say minerals, vitamins, maybe with some help, they'll say water and air. But they'll go dragging, kicking, screaming down the barn aisle as soon as I say, what about proteins? because proteins are a little bit more complicated. And I've spent a lot of time talking about uh, proteins. I've been talking about the metabolism of the horse and how it works. And I know that you guys want to, uh, half of you, half of your brain wants to run away and say, I'd rather just muck stalls listening to music. And the other part of your brain is saying, no, but I really want to understand this because I know Dr. Tucker really is good at breaking things down into simple things. So, Listen to that other voice that says, listen to me, because without proteins, you're basically dead. And the first place I always start off with proteins is to show you just how important they are. So the word protein is something we see on a feed bag where it says 10%, 12 14% protein. And then it puts in this funny word called crude. So it'll say crude protein. You're sitting there like, well, I don't like anything crude. I'm more refined than that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't understand it, but I don't like it. So I just run away from it. And uh, th basically, when they measure protein, they take the uh, scoop of feed, you know, a certain uh, amount of weight, and they put it in this machine that burns it to a crisp. And it measures what comes out of it, the carbon, the hydrogen, the oxygen, and the nitrogen. And then they look at the ratio. And because protein is the only element in the food that has nitrogen, then we can just assume that, assuming there's no air to start with, because the air is 70, 79% nitrogen, uh, that they will, uh, any nitrogen in there will represent how much protein is in the food. And that's is a very crude way of measuring it, and hence the word crude protein. So they basically burn the food up. And they measure how much nitrogen is given off. And that will tell you the crude protein content. So if it's 10% protein and you have, let's say, 100 grams of this food, 10 grams is protein, the 90 uh, grams or 90% of the remaining food is anything but protein. So actually, that's not true because there's carbon and hydrogen and oxygen coming off from the protein. But uh, the nitrogen basically tells you uh, what percentage of it is protein. That's why it's such a crude factor. But let's look at what protein really is. Uh, protein is a very large molecule that's made up of smaller molecules. And those smaller molecules we call amino acids. And the reason they're called amino is because in chemistry, they have what's called an amine group. And the amine group is a bunch of atoms that have nitrogen. And those uh, amine groups are very easy to see. You don't have to be an organic chemist to recognize an amino acid when you see it because it has this big N in the, in the uh, structure. So amino acids uh, are interesting. The way I like to compare them to help you understand it a little bit better is that amino acids are like letters to words. So you put the letters together and you make a word. So let's say you want to make the word watch, W-A-T-C-H. You're going to need the amino acid called W-A-T-C-H. You need five amino acids, and they have to be put together in the correct order. Because if you have W-T-C-H-A, you don't have a word that we recognize, and that would be a protein that doesn't work. So you want, uh, you want to stay... Uh, you want to make sure that proteins are put together correctly. And what instructs these amino acids to come together 
correctly, is basically a blueprint that every one of our cells carries. And many of you heard of genetics or DNA. Now many of you heard of RNA due to the virus. And what DNA is, it's your basic uh, blueprint. And the blueprint goes over to a part of the cell that creates RNA and the RNA replicates um, these uh, amino acids that come spitting out in the proper order. Just imagine if you had a machine that you could throw in, you know, <laughs> uh, let's just say, um, a, forgive me if you're vegetarian, but let's say you throw in a steak. No, I got a better idea. Let's pretend you wanna make a cake. The cake takes certain ingredients and the ingredients have to be put together in a certain order. Otherwise the cake doesn't come out the same or it shouldn't, doesn't come out as well. So there's a particular order that amino acids have to go in to make the word, to make it work right or the protein to make it work right. So all proteins are made up of amino acids. Now, some of these proteins are rather large and they can have tens of thousands of proteins, uh, of, of amino acids in there to make the protein correctly. Uh, some of the proteins that you can think of are muscle. Everyone knows that muscle is protein. I don't know why everybody knows that, but they know um, it shouldn't be fat and it shouldn't be sugar. So you pretty much know that it's uh, a protein and you've heard of bodybuilders and they eat a lot of protein to build muscle. So that's a pretty good idea. But the things that connect the muscles to the bones are called ligaments, uh, pardon me, or tendons. And what keeps the bones together, ligaments. And then of course you have the coverings, the fascia and all the other connected tissue, we call it as a group. And they're all proteins. So all connected tissue, including muscles, are proteins, including your suspensor ligaments and your deep digital flexor tendons. Now let's look at another group of things called the integument, which is your skin, uh, your hair, your fingernails, the horse's hair, the horse's hoof. Uh, they're all protein and they're a mixture of protein and fat obviously in the skin, but protein is basically making up all the hair and the hoof. So when you look at the hoof, you're looking basically a protein, which most ladies know is keratin, especially uh, the people who try to straighten their hair, they get keratin treatments to keep their hair nice and straight. And we'll get into that as a special protein a little bit later on. Let's look at another group. Um, maybe you guys due to COVID have heard about immunoglobulins and T cells and your immunity. Well, almost all of that are proteins, proteins that come together, the cytokines, the inflammatory um, molecules that create the inflammation, the um, ACE receptors, the spike protein, these are all proteins. Even the virus is a protein. In fact, all viruses are somewhat, uh, basically your DNA kind of encapsulated or not encapsulated, but that's a protein. So um, your immune system is basically protein. And if you're low in protein, you're gonna have a very low, uh, poor responding immune system. Uh, let's look at another one. Uh, neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are proteins that send signals from one nerve to another. And some of you actually know some of these. You might not know much about them, but you know the words dopamine, serotonin, mel melatonin. Uh, they're all uh, proteins that are put together and they are neurotransmitters that communicate one cell to the other. And in the neurodegenerative disease that everyone for whatever reason calls Cushing's disease, is basically a neurodegenerative disease where the horse has an inability of transmitting or making or whatever uh, dopamine. And we give a uh, pergolide or pergolide like drug that is a dopamine replacement. So that's uh, evidence to me of a neurodegenerative disease, maybe lack of uh, protein in the horse. Uh, let's look at another one enzymes. Enzymes are these special molecules that blast apart things. An enzyme. Um, helps things work. Uh, they can be catalysts. They can take large molecules and hack them up into smaller molecules. Uh, some of the enzymes would be amylase, um, uh, trypsin. Um, there's a bunch of words out there. Anything that ends in ASE basically is an enzyme. And those enzymes are all proteins. So proteins are very important into making digestion or to making events occur that are within our cells. For instance, maybe you've heard me talk about the GLUT4 transport, which is a transport system that brings sugar into the cell. 
after it receives it from insulin coming into the cell. And that GLUT4 GLUT transport is a series of enzymes that trigger things like opening doors and passing things through the cell uh, and making things happen. Those are all enzymes, are all proteins. Uh, one last group of proteins, of course, are your hormones. And most hormones are proteins or they're proteins and fats put together. These include testosterone, estrogen, as well as leptin, lectin, no, leptin, uh, ghrelin, um, Gosh, uh, there's so many ho hormones, uh, thyroid hormone, T4, they're all proteins. So now that you have an understanding just how important proteins are, they're basically everything. So let's put it together. Sugars and fats provide energy. Uh, sugars and fats uh, can provide protection, can create walls, can create uh, coatings, and they're very important. But the main structure of your body and all the operational things that go on in your body, in your horse's body, are proteins. And this is why proteins are so important uh, to ingest, to produce, and to deliver throughout your body to keep your body intact and moving. So when I go around this countryside and I see top lines disappearing from horses, I see these big bellies on horses that are just hanging out. Uh, I see hooves that are falling apart. Um, I see a hair coat that looks like it, it needs a, a, a special treatment. Um, it's basically all protein deficiencies. That's how I look at it. And that's how, what my belief system is. And I've been able to add a high quality protein to all these horses. And we've been able to see a lot of this stuff disappear. So um, let's get into what a high quality protein is, or let's just look at a couple other factors. There's so many things. If you recall in one of my other podcasts, I look at this as a big carousel with the horses going around and around and around, and you aren't too sure exactly where to jump on. And then once you jump on, you have to kind of wind your way around to the horse that you actually want to get on for the ride. Um, and that's kind of the way discussing proteins are, because we need to understand the basics. So let's keep going with the basics and the idea that our proteins are nothing but words build up of letters or amino acids. So that's your analogy. You've got a book of words that we call the dictionary. And in that dictionary, there's 10,000 words. I don't know how many words are in a dictionary, but it, maybe there's more. Um, and every one of those words is made up of letters. Now, this is what I find fascinating. Depending on how you combine them and how many you use, you'll come up with different words. So if we come back to the word watch, W-A-T-C-H, and we add those five letters in that particular order, you'll have a word called watch, which is really good. So that's what I want you to think about. All the words or all the proteins in the bodies are made up of just amino acids, which are equivalent to letters. Now, all those words in the dictionary are made up of only 26 letters here in America and the English dictionary. Now, it's unfortunate there's a lot of young people, and I've tried this over and over and over again, barn after barn after barn. And if you're not 30 years old yet, uh, you don't know how many letters are in an alphabet. But you do, all of you know that there's a limited set of letters, and through their combinations, will create all the words. Now, same with proteins. There are between one and three billion proteins, that's billion with a B, in, in your body. And that's in, in every cell of your body, which is like incredible. It's such a large number. It's hard for you to even imagine. Uh, but if you all understand that gasoline is made up of molecules, how many molecules of gasoline are sitting in your you know, car or your diesel in your truck? It, it, it's just beyond understanding how many molecules of H2O are there in the ocean. It's just too numerous to count. So these are very, very small. Uh, they haven't been able to really photograph a protein accurately. They can get a, a shadowy picture. Uh, they can tear them apart and know exactly what makes them up. But they're too small to take a picture of. Uh, and there's that many. And there's 35,000 different proteins inside a human cell. Of course, every cell is going to be different. But the idea is that there's a huge number of of proteins, different proteins in every cell of your body. So 
what would happen if you get, got a dictionary that's missing one letter? I think that's the best way to look at it. If I gave you a dictionary missing one letter and I'll take the letter W and take it out of there, what you have left is all the words in the dictionary except who, what, why, when, how, and tomorrow. And watch. So I can't say to you, where will we meet tomorrow? Because that sentence turns out to be meet. And you can't even ask me what or where or why or when. You know, there's nothing you can say because there's no W's. You can't make the word any words made with W. So that's called a limiting amino acid. And the limiting amino acids are those that are limited in availability in a horse's environment. Now, this is where it starts to get a little bit deeper because not all amino acids have to be consumed by the horse. Um, it's debatable how many are actually uh, created by the horse, but we're just gonna pick the number 10. And there's 20 total amino acids. Remember, there's 26 letters that make up all the words in the dictionary. There's 20 amino acids that make up all the proteins in the horse. So, you know, somebody's going to come by and say it's 19 or 21. You know, I doesn't matter. It's still basically 20. And 10 of those the horse can make. So that means 10 of them they actually have to consume. So that means um, they're called essential. In other words, if they can't eat them, if they can't find them in the environment to eat, then they're not going to survive. It's that simple. Same with you and me, by the way. You have to have uh, eat about 10 amino acids every day. Okay. So when I say high quality protein, I mean it is a food that has all the amino acids, at least all 10 of the essential amino acids. If it's a good quality, it's gonna have some of them, but not all of them. And if it's a poor, poor quality protein, it's gonna have a lot less. So what I'm getting at is most of the horses that we know of today are kept in confinement behind a fence. Uh, and inside that fence, there's either dirt or there's uh, a limited amount of one style of grass. I call them monograsses or monograss pastures. So let's say you've seeded it with one type of grass and it grows, it's specially made for horses and it, it does well, but it's probably limited in the amount of proteins that it has as far as high quality amino acids. Same with your hay. Your hay is probably just one type. Maybe you feed two different types. Maybe you change it throughout the year and you have three or four different types of hay. But grass as a rule doesn't have all the amino acids they need. In reality, a horse is a migratory animal. They are not supposed to be kept behind a fence. Um, everybody who says, you know, they want to keep their horses natural as possible. And they'll talk about, you know, whether they put shoes in or bits or, you know, they use power tools or hand floats. You know, they all talk about this or dewarming with diatomaceous earth. I say, well, if step one, if you want to get your horse to be more like a horse and natural, take your fence down. And of course, that's absurd because the horse is be going to, you know, they're going to be hit by a car as it crosses the road. I mean, in today's world, we can't keep our horses unless we put them behind a fence. And usually within that fence, you have a limited monopasture and then you feed hay and that's a monograss. So you're kind of stuck. So in the reality, it would be the horse would migrate from the Southern states all the way up to the Northern states for the summer and then back down to the Southern states. And as they did, they would have a smorgasbord. And no, I can't spell that word, but it's a variety of plants that they would eat. There are there's one gal who said to me once, her horse will stop at a rock that's covered in that lichen, that soft light green to dark green fuzz. And they will sit there for 10, 15, 20 minutes and just eat it and eat it, eat it, scraping their teeth over it, licking it up, getting as much as they can. And then after about that much, they're done. They walk away. What kind of amino acids are in lichen? Nobody's ever studied that that I know of. Uh, maybe you guys have heard it and you can tell me, but that's part of the broad um, smorgasbord uh, variety of plants that a horse gets exposed to in this migratory patterns. And we've taken that away. And 
everyone's worried about the nutrient content of haze and the minerals that have been taken out of the ground and through uh, industrial planting, et cetera. And I'm not going to discredit that. I, I don't think my brain capacity can come around that because I think every farm is different. Every hay batch that you get is different. I think a lot of these farmers add uh, minerals uh, to their uh, haze, to their pastures to kind of get it back up there. Uh, they try to keep the microbiome of the soil right. Otherwise, they don't have really good crops. So the one thing I do know that is probably not arguable is the fact that the total amount of amino acids that enters your horse's mouth is chronically deficient in their ability to get what they need in a day. And that boils down to how much protein should your horse be getting? And that's one of those things that there are a couple of studies out there that are showing it. And I found another one study that really did a good job of analyzing how much protein a horse should get and how much protein in excess of that is actually consumed. And basically it was about one half to one gram per pound of body weight. Now I know it's frustrating for you um, in the metric system and in the imperial system to do this me mixed metaphor that we have grams per pound. And it's unfortunate it's where I'm stuck. I've, I've uh, done the uh, conversions and I've written it in my blog so you can see what it is actually. But most uh, ingredients list the grams that are available, grams of protein. And then you have to look at the weight of your horse. And if it's uh, 1,100 pounds or 500 kilograms, uh, they need between one half and one gram per pound or half kilo, kilo uh, of weight. And basically what it boils down to. Now, that sounds good. And some of you may have even scribbled that down, one half to one gram per pound of body weight. You've got a 1,200 pound horse, let's say. Uh, that means he needs between 600 and 1,200 grams of protein. So now you're rubbing your hands together. You're getting kind of excited because you're going to run to the feed room. You're going to find out how many grams of protein are in your food. And this is where math comes in. And when math comes in and a sprinkling of fairy dust, and you're left like, why did I even listen to this podcast? Because this is where you break down. Nobody's really helping you. Most people who have horses or anything in the world want things simple and cookie cutter, and that's that. And when it comes to protein, it's not that simple. And here's the reason why. First of all, not all ingredients have high quality protein. So if you say something has 10% protein, that means if you have a pound of it or a kilogram of it, you're going to have either a 10th of a pound or a 10th of a kilogram um, of protein. Well, that's fine and dandy, but what quality of protein is it? That's step number one. Does it have all the amino acids or is there something missing? Is there a letter missing from the amino acids, the essential amino acids, that if they eat a ton of this stuff, they still are not going to get that one particular amino acid? That's question number one. And then question number two is, not all proteins is absorbed the same. When protein is swallowed, it's put into the stomach. And in the stomach, two things occur. One, it's broken down by the acids in the stomach. And that's really important because proteins are too big. You cannot absorb protein. All proteins have to be broken down into smaller proteins called peptides or even smaller parts called amino acids. And those can be absorbed. That's important. And number two, there are enzymes in us that actually inhibit some of these proteins from being absorbed or broken down properly. It's called uh, trypsin inhibitors. And these things that are in foods will make the food unavailable for absorption. So let's just pretend that you have a dictionary and it's missing a letter. You're not going to have a lot of words. We got that. But let's say you've got a dictionary and you've got all the letters, but the letters are scattered outside the dictionary and you can't put them in the dictionary to make the words. So here you've got a, a protein coming in and you're not being able to absorb that. And I call that bioavailability. And uh, there's a lot of guys smarter than me that are working on that word, bioavailability. 
uh, versus some other things to identify how much protein, how much is amino acids are actually absorbed. And this is one of these cases that you look at your bag of feed and says 10% protein. And you say, okay, if I'm going to feed a scoop, how much does the scoop weigh? Well, let's say the scoop weighs five pounds. No, let's make it a pound. So the pound is 454 kilograms. If you can't remember that, put your hand up if you're watching this on video. But if you're not, throw up four fingers, just four fingers, leave your thumb folded down against your palm. And remember the number four, then flip your thumb up. Now you have five fingers, then tuck your thumb back in and it's four. So it's 454 grams, 454 grams per pound. And so you've got 454 grams. And if your protein is at 10%, that's what the label says, or your hay analysis says 10%, 10% of 454 grams, you just move the decimal place, one place from the right to the left. And now you have 45 and a half grams. And so your horse eating one pound of whatever you put in front of him at 10% protein is absorbing, is getting 45.5 grams. That's 10%. Now, granted 12, 14, 16% protein, you're going to have to do a little bit different math and I'll leave that up to you. But the idea the concept is the same. If you're feeding by weight, which you all should be doing, whatever the scoop of food that you've got or the amount of hay that you're feeding, and you find out how much protein is in there and take that percentage and multiply it by the weight that you're giving the horse. And it's going to give you a number. So let's say you feed 20 pounds of hay and the hay is 10% protein. 20 pounds of hay uh, times 10% is two pounds of protein. So now you know you've got two pounds of protein, 454 grams times two is about 900 grams of protein you're putting in there. And you've got a horse that's 1,200 pounds. You say, wow, I'm right in the middle of that. I'm between 600 and 1,200 grams that I want to be feeding my horse. I'm at 900. I'm doing all, all okay. Well, here's the problem. Two problems. Most protein from hays and from grasses from hays and grasses. That covers 99% of what you're feeding a horse. Unless you're feeding grain, then it's not. But let's just say 99 to 100% of what you're feeding a horse is either pasture or hay. The absorption rate is about 50%. So now you've gone from 900 grams down to 454 grams because that 10% of 20 pounds, which is two pounds, at 50% is one pound. One pound is 454 grams. So now you're feeding 20 pounds of hay and they're getting 454 grams. That's less than what they should be eating for a day. I find that fascinating because everyone thinks that a horse is being fed hay should be okay or on pasture. Well, there's even worse news because if you check the amino acid profile of most of these hays and most of the um, pastures that are out there, they're gonna be limited in their amino acid profiles. Remember, pasture is a dormant or, or a seasonal grass. They grow during some of the year and then the rest of the year, they don't grow at all. And hay is always last summer's grass. That's just the definition of hay. So you're only feeding grass that has some sort of nutrient content in part of the year. Now, you need to have an analyst uh, analyze what kind of pasture you have to find out what kind of protein content you have in there. But usually it's about um, 10%. It could be up to 16% protein. But if you don't know what the amino acid content of it is, you don't know if you're feeding a high quality protein or not. Does it have all the essential amino acids? And I can tell you right now, almost all hays and grasses that I know of don't have a broad spectrum of amino acids. They do not have all 10 of the essential amino acids. So now you've got a horse that's eating 20 pounds of hay, 10% protein, which is two pounds, 50% absorption, which is one pound. And out of that 454 grams or one pound of protein that the horse is actually absorbing, it's not getting all the essential amino acids. So here's your problem. Let's go back to the word watch. Let's play a game. We're going to throw on your barn floor, hopefully it's clean, a bunch of wooden blocks. And on those blocks, they have a letter. Every side of the block has the same letter. And we scramble around and we all say, let's make, make the word watch. 
and I make the word watch and you make the word watch and somebody else makes a word watch and we're putting them together because there's a thousand pieces on here. At some point, somebody says, I can't find a T. Well, I'm Doc T, so I give my T's away and they can make the watch. But at some point, somebody says, I can't find a C. And everybody, you, me, your friends, they cannot find any more C's. That letter C becomes a limiting letter. The word watch can no longer be made. So the same thing applies to limiting amino acid. There's a point where the horse runs out of the letter C or whatever amino acid is missing, and it can't be made. Now, the word watch without a C, you can have W-H-A-T. You can make the word what. You can make the word at. You can make the word a. Or if you're British, you can even say ta. Okay, so there's a bunch of words that you can make. Um, you make hat, H-A-T, but you can't make watch because there's no C's. And that's what happens. If your horse is not consuming one of the essential amino acids, there will no longer be the ability to, to make the word or the protein that they're trying to make. Now, what's really interesting is if you buy any amino acid supplements out there, or if you buy any grain bags, you're going to see the three limiting amino acids that are always there. They're always going to be in there. They are lysine, and lysine is everywhere. It's it's used in almost every protein in your body. It's just like, you know, a vowel, you know, a really common vowel. Most words are made with the letter E or the letter A, and that's what lysine is. Then there's threonine, T-H-R-E, threonine. And then there's methionine. And methionine is really important because you, you're going to learn something about that a little bit later. So lysine, threonine, and uh, methionine are your three limiting amino acids. So if you get triamino or if you get any of these amino acid supplements, you're going to see those three in there. But the problem is they ask you to put a scoop in. Well, they need more than a scoop of that stuff. They need a lot more than that to really meet the needs uh, of what they are putting together. Without these letters, without these amino acids, there's some proteins that won't be made. So as the protein gets destroyed, and this is a really important part, uh, there's nothing to replace it and rebuild it. All proteins break down at some point. Um, there's a little interesting sidebar I want to tell you about uh, that back in the 50s, we did a lot of nuclear testing where we blew up these nukes out in Nevada. And what was interesting was the carbon-14, which is the uh, radioactive carbon that was made out of these explosions, floated around the world, and every animal on the planet has carbon-14 from these nuclear explosions in them. It is slowly dying away. There'll be a point in the future where uh, we won't have that anymore. What's really interesting is maybe you've heard of something called carbon-14 dating, and this is how they can date how old uh, a, a tree is or a, a fossilized uh, bone that we've seen, they use carbon-14 dating. Well, they've been able to determine how fast our tissues are actually rotating through. So the muscle you build today lasts about six years and then is completely destroyed and new muscle comes in and takes over. And I have no proof, don't know, but I'm just going to make an assumption that this is true for all mammals, and that includes the horse. So let's just pretend that it takes six years for the muscles to replace itself. It is a theory of mine. Again, these are just theories, uh, but that's what this whole podcast is out there to, to put forward theories, ideas, and then ask people, does this make sense or not? Well, one of them is that a horse that's six years old usually looks pretty good unless they've been a racehorse. And if they're a racehorse, a lot of racehorses at six are broken down because they're worked so hard and they're fed a lot of grain. Uh, but most horses do okay. But boy, that 12 year mark, if you've got a horse, they make it from 10 to 14 and it's not lame, doesn't look bad, still has a top line, then something's being done right. But I see most of these 12 year olds are breaking down. They have some soft tissue injuries like suspensories. And it's so frustrating to see these guys because you just want to um, you just want to say, look, you know, it's six times two, 12 years, and they're not getting the proteins needed to replace and rebuild what they have when they were full. And then, of course, the next six digit is 18. 
And, you know, most horses at 18 are retired. They're turned out. Uh, some people call them old. Some people start feeding them senior feed. And by 24, uh, most horses are dead. Uh, they, they look like horrible. Not all horses. There's some horses that do really well. But then the next mark is 30. And, you know, most horses don't make it to 30. And it's certainly to 36. And that's about it. So I look at it in terms of six-year increments. And I think it's based on the regeneration of muscles as well as connective tissue and everything else. So that's my little sidebar on a carbon-14 dating and regeneration. The important news point to make is you are making proteins day and night, 24 seven, since the time you were an embryo to the time you die, you're making proteins. So these proteins go out and they've got targets. They're gonna become a hair follicle or they're gonna become part of your um, integument or hormone or whatever it takes. They're out there. And we don't always make them correctly. So sometimes they're made badly. Luckily, we have an inspector that goes out there. And these heat shock proteins go out there. Yes, another protein. And they inspect all the proteins. They basically size it up. Have you met all the criteria? If not, you are destroyed. That protein is destroyed before it ever gets to where it needs to go. And the protein, when it's destroyed, is basically the words are taken apart into letters. So all these amino acids become free to make another protein. There's no C, they'll make what, or hat, or do something. But they always are out there trying to build and do something. And your uh, cells are constantly pumping out these, uh, they take in the amino acids, they pump out these proteins. So it's a constant, constant, constant product, uh, thing that's going on that requires materials and requires a, a cell that's functioning properly. Just like any work site, if you've gone past any work site in your car, or maybe you work as a construction worker, you know that materials come in or a factory line, materials come in and things are made. Uh, we know all know that their computer chips are, you know, they're finding that they can't make enough computer chips for our automobiles and automobile production is stopped based on one chip that can't be made. So they're waiting until they get more stock back in. And when they do, they make more vehicles. Well, the same thing happens here. This is why we're constantly eating and we're constantly putting protein in our mouths. And that goes down into our digestive system and gets carried across and goes into our cells. And there they're converted into proteins and those proteins are shunted off and put to work someplace. So, that's it in a nutshell, basically, protein. Um, it's not that complicated. You just have to make them all the time. They're breaking down all the time. You have to remake them. It's just that simple. And your goal for your horse is between one half and one gram of protein per uh, pound. So 1,200 pound horse is 600, 1,200 uh, grams of protein. And I picked a uh, weight of 1,200 pounds. Forgive me if you're into metrics, but metrics should be okay. Uh, the number 1,200 is so easily divisible. So half of that is 600. Do you have a 600-pound pony? Do you have half of that, a 300-pound mini or smaller, a 200-pound mini or larger, an 800-pound, 900-pound? All those are divisible. So if you have a pound of soybean meal, which will provide all the amino acids that a horse needs at 1,200 pounds, then you could feed a half a pound of soybean meal for 600 pound horse, three quarters for 900 pound, one quarter for 300 pound. See how that works? It's so simple, it's just pure math. So you can play with the numbers, look how much your horse weighs and take a pound and divide it um, by the uh, 1200 by the size of your horse. It's 600s, 800s, 900s, 300s, 100. You know, is it 1500? Is it 1800 pounds? All divisible. That's why the number 12 is such a beautiful number. Yes, I threw in there one pound of soybean meal per 1,200 pounds horse per day will get you about 600 pound, grams of protein. Actually, 625, give or take. Uh, the reason that is, is because soybean meal is 47, 48% protein. So if you're feeding a fat pound of it, about half of it is going in as protein and it's a high quality protein and gets absorbed at about 80%. So the bottom line is you get 174 grams of protein, high quality protein from a pound of soybean meal. Now, this is where all of a sudden the brakes get hit hard. So many people hate soybeans. 
They just outright hate them. They say it's got glyphosate on it. It's genetically modified. It'll make them uh, feminine. It'll do all these things. And, and, they, and they just shut down. So hear me out. Number one, I've used soybean meal since the beginning of time of my horses in 1973. I've never, ever, ever had a problem with soybean meal given to a horse. Number two, soybeans are a legume no different than alfalfa or clover or peanut hay and peanuts. They're all legumes. Horses do well with legumes. Humans, not so good. Humans don't need legumes. They should not eat them, but horses can, all right? So they do well with them. Their gut bacteria love them. Uh, three, all proteins are broken down inside the stomach into peptides and amino acids. So if you have a genetically modified uh, plant, that was genetically modified to accept an herbicide applied to it. When it gets into the horse, it is broken down into its pieces and reassembled on the other side. So I'm not too sure how genetic modification works uh, as far as after the stomach, but the one of the biggest uh, advocates for getting rid of genetically modified food wrote a two-page article in the Wall Street Journal, I think it's about three years ago now, two pages that said, I apologize, I was wrong. There's nothing wrong with genetically modified food. And if you look, there is, there's no diseases caused by genetically modified food. Uh, certainly a bigger concern is eating all the sugar and obesity and insulin resistance. That's not caused by genetically modified food. That's caused by eating sugar. Four, everyone's worried about glyphosate. I get it. I talked to a client of mine who is a, uh, who researches uh, herbicides used in the state of Florida and makes sure that uh, we aren't getting any problems with that. And I said to him, so what's the big deal with uh, uh, glyphosate? I said, it's got a half-life of about 120 days. So by the time it gets to us, it's pretty much inactive. And he looked at me, he says, if you're lucky it's 120 days, it's usually a lot less. I was like, well, there you go. He said, there's no problem with glyphosate. Now, it was used as an antibiotic. I get it. And it, it probably is going to kill a lot of bacteria in our gut. Uh, if you apply it to your skin in its active form, you can get the, the cancer that everyone is all, you know, worried about. But that's from applying it. But glyphosate is touching our hay. It's touching the organic wine. They found glyphosate in it. Glyphosate is spread worldwide. It is in everything. And yet it has a half-life of maybe 120 days. So by the time uh, the food gets to you, it's pretty much gone. So then we look at uh, the, the soybean meal. And what's happened is the soybean has been dehulled. So that means whatever residues are on the outer shell, they're stripped off and gone. And then the soybean is de, um, um, it has that oil extracted. And that oil comes sucking out and it's put off to the side. Now, if you remember when I talked about oils and horses, I talked about seed oils and that's a seed oil, it's not a fruit oil. So it is a polyunsaturated fatty acid and PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, will bind to the lipopolysaccharides, the LPSs inside your um, gut, and they can transfer across the gut membrane and create a leaky gut syndrome. And they found these oils and LPSs in your joints that cause lameness. So you don't want to be having soybean oil that's been extracted. Now, believe it or not, soybean oil is hanging around. So what do they do with it? They fry your food with it. And believe me, it makes really good, tasty uh, food. You know, French fries and soybean oil is like, tastes great. And they also put it in your, all your uh, horse feeds because they have to lubricate the machine with, um, with uh, food grade oils, which soybean oil is. So they take it out of the soybean meal. They put the soybean meal into your senior feed, and then they put the oil back in it to lubricate the machine, which is causing gut inflammation, which I just can't understand. And then they throw in the soybean hulls. Again, I can't understand that because the hulls are where the lectins are, those plant proteins that can cause inflammation. So we're taking the hulls off, we're taking the oil out, and now we're toasting it, which means they heat the uh, soybean meal up with steam, believe it or not, they call it toasting. 
And the steam will denature this one enzyme called TRIPS inhibitor and makes that um, anti-enzyme go away. So now the soybean meal can be absorbed at 80% all uh, essential amino acids. And that way, when you're adding one pound of soybean meal uh, per 1,200 pound horse per day, you're going to be absorbing 174 grams. Add that to your 20 pounds of hay at 10% which is 454, and you're up to about 625 grams of protein, and you're at the minimum for your 1,200-pound horse. If your 1,200-pound horse or your 1,000-pound horse is racing, whether it's uh, thoroughbred racing or standard bred or endurance or competitive trail ride or anything else where they're exerting themselves and using a lot of muscle, uh, that muscle is breaking down. They need more proteins, more amino acids to come in there and build back that, that muscle, connected tissue, immune system, uh, neurotransmitters, um, all these things. They need all these amino acids to come in. And that's where soybean meal comes in. I have not seen any other product out there that is as inexpensive, as ubiquitous, and so helpful and time-tested in a horse as that. Uh, there are other ones. I've got a client who's big on hemp. They love uh, feeding hemp, but hemp is expensive. Yes, it has a good amino acid profile. Go ahead and feed it. If you don't want to feed soybean meal, feed hemp. But I don't see the economic value of that. I think soybean meal uh, is just as good. But uh, you can find organically grown soybean meal. Oh, and back to making all your horses feminine, feeding estrogen. Um, that came from uh, some humans that were fed uh, soybeans that have isoflavones and isoflavones will enhance the estrogens that you make. So you become more sensitive to them. So it's not that you make more estrogen, but you become more sensitive to it. They haven't seen that in horses. Nowhere has that been reported ever happening in a horse, uh, uh, a male horse developing uh, mammary glands, for instance. It just hasn't happened. Not in all the time that I've ever used it. And then I joke when somebody's very dead set against using soybean in their horse because it's going to feminize them. I just simply ask, did you think about that when you castrated them? And the conversation comes to a screeching halt. And usually somebody laughs, I hope, but we don't think about the esterification or the feminization, I should say, of all our stallions by removing their testicles but we do it in a heartbeat. And now people are actually removing ovaries and spaying their, their horses and they spay and castrate their dogs all the time. And yet nobody raises the fuss over that, but boy, soybean enters the mouth and forget it. You know, your horse is gonna be doomed for life. Hasn't happened, please send me something that shows me where a good study was done, where it shows this, but I haven't seen it. So I think I've covered all the reasons why not to feed soybean meal, but I love soybean meal because it is inexpensive. It is worldwide. It is one of the leading commodities here in America. It's used in cattle. It's used in uh, swine. It's used in poultry. And almost everybody can buy it. And I'm always laughing, not laughing, I shouldn't say laughing. I'm always shocked that people say, I can't find soybean meal. It's because you're going to the horse feed dealers. You're not going to the cattle dealers, swine dealers, or country type dealers. Um, it's an ingredient, everybody carries it, uh, that uh, feed, sells feed to any other uh, animals besides horses. So they have it. I have one gal who said, this has turned her life around. Uh, it, she's so happy that she took her horses off grain and added a soybean meal. And uh, by the way, I live in Kenya, which if you don't know it, that's in some place in the middle of Africa. So maybe not dead center of Africa, but right, right in Africa, and they get soybean meal. Um, so it's worldwide. It's just one of those commodities that are out there. But be sure you're looking for soybean meal, dehulled, oil extracted. And um, that oil extraction can be either from pressing, which is not that common, or for, by solvents, which they put it in a solvent that takes the oil out. And then there's none of the solvent left when it comes out. It's highly volatile, it means it evaporates pretty quickly. And uh, they have a place to recycle that and then use it again. Um, many of them will add a caking, anti-caking agent, a flow agent, uh, which is pretty much inert. 
and is not going to affect the horse. And that helps the soybean meal to move through the augers and the tubing that they have, the grain plants. So um, that's what it is. 50 pound bag costs approximately uh, 16 bucks in America, um, maybe 18, 20. It's becoming more popular, the more I talk about it and people are getting smart. But even if it's 20 bucks for 50 pounds, it's the best money you've ever spent. And what it does, it will add a hair coat that's unbelievable in about two weeks. If your horse is really bad or it's going into winter, you might not see the improvement of the hair coat until the following spring when it sheds out and it sheds out beautifully. And then when it comes in the winter coat, oh my gosh, it looks like a mink coat because it looks beautiful. So that'll be their first sign. Second, you'll see the belly go away. That happens in two to four weeks. The uh, big hay belly goes away. And the reason for that is uh, the abdominal muscles start to strengthen quickly because the abdominal muscles are being used every moment that horse is alive and walking. So that will help tuck up the belly. Uh, third, uh, don't tell your fairy you're doing this and just have him or her just go ahead and trim. And, and if you shoe the horses, uh, have them shoe them. And in about two to four months, they'll turn to you and say, I don't know what you're doing, but I've never seen these hooves look any better. And you'll see the growth come down from the corner band about uh, at two inches. And all of a sudden you become evident. You say, wow, look at that. Uh, the hoof walls are becoming more vertical uh, instead of splitting out because they're starting to get strong. Uh, then in six to 12 months, you get the top line back. And sometimes it takes up to two years. Um, I've had plenty of people who've had cushionoid horses that with the help of the veterinary, they go ahead and test them. They keep testing them and they take them off their cushions medication and um, they're able to go uh, medication free. So that again is uh, anecdotal, but they do it with the help of the veterinarian. You should never uh, change any medications. Your horse is being given under care of your veterinarian until that veterinarian is on board and is helping you do this. Um, some of the signs of protein deficiency um, are really important. The top line, we've mentioned the hair coat, the, the belly, but the hoof deformities. I mean, we didn't have white line disease in horses uh, back in the 80s. It didn't exist. Now, all these horses have white line disease. We have farriers whose their sole job is quarter cracks and toe track cracks. Uh, we want to get rid of those. Um, splayed out, deformed, platter feet of thoroughbreds. Uh, thin soles, cruddy, cruddy soles, thrush, all these things are signs of protein deficiency. And for one reason, one reason only. And this is really cool. The hoof is all keratin. Keratin is a protein that women know about as their hair. Keratin is made up of a bunch of amino acids, but 24% or one quarter of the hoof is made up of one amino acid. Now, one amino acid is called cysteine. Now, this is what's so cool about cysteine. The horse makes it, but they have to make it out of another amino acid that they have to eat, methionine. And we all just heard in the beginning that methionine is one of the three limiting amino acids. And if you're missing a methionine, your horse cannot make cysteine. So what makes methionine so special? Well, I told you that, maybe I didn't tell you this, but I'll tell you now. All amino acids are made up of four molecules, four atoms, not molecules, four atoms or elements. Remember the periodic table of elements? Remember water is hydrogen, oxygen, uh, sugar is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, fat is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Well, all amino acids are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and one other. I'm trying to hold this up in front and not block, not block my microphone. One other, all right? I've got crooked fingers if you're watching this. Sorry, that's just the way it is. Years are working. All right, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and one other. And I already told you what it was. It's nitrogen. And nitrogen comes from us breathing air in. Nitrogen is in 78, 79% of the air we breathe. So every breath you take in, it's almost all nitrogen. 20% um, oxygen, 19, 20% oxygen. And then... The meat that we eat or the plants that we eat, any protein that we eat, we're taking in nitrogen. So that's coming in. But if you notice, I'm holding one finger down. That one finger is in methionine, and that's called sulfur. 
Now, many of you don't know sulfur, but almost every one of you have ever smelled bad water. That's sulfur. That's that sulfur smell in water. If you've ever accidentally burned your hair with a hair dryer and it starts to stink, that's sulfur. And of course, we've all been in the barn when the farrier takes a hot shoe and applies it to the bottom of the hoof and it burns and all that smoke goes down low and it stinks. Sorry, farriers. That's not the smell of money. That's the smell of sulfur. And that's the methionine that has been put into the hoof. But unfortunately, methionine can't get there. Methionine has trouble. So before I go any further, I just want to tell you another little bit of organic chemistry. If you and I decided that we would dance together in the barn aisle and somebody starts, you know, playing some, you know, really good music, I mean, you know, with a fiddle and we're all, you know, it's tapping our feet and clapping our hands. And you and I reach out, we hold each other by our hand and we start swinging and dancing and we're having a great time. But because our hands, our hands aren't strong enough, somewhere in this event, we break loose. And so we say, let's dance some more. But this time we come with both hands and we grab each other with both hands. And we start swinging and dancing and yeah, la, la, la. And we don't let go. In chemistry, that is the difference between a single bond and a double bond. A double bond makes the bond stronger. It's got more attraction. And in methionine, sulfurs make double bonds. So if you have an amino uh, 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 protein that's very long, I stretch my arms out. I know you can't see it if you're just listening to me, but I stretch my arms all the way out to the side. And in this protein, there's some methionines, and the methionines have these sulfurs, and these sulfurs like to make double bonds. They'll come together and they'll clasp. And if you're watching me on the video, I've taken my two hands, I've clasped them together like a coupler on a railroad. And now my arms are stronger and they can, they can just, everything's more strong because it's connected together. That's what double bonds do. So methionine can't do the double bonds. It just physically can't. So it goes off to the liver and liver creates cysteine. So methionine becomes cysteine, then becomes cysteine, and cysteine goes in the hooves, and it makes those double bonds that create all the strength in the hoof. It's shocking that every time I read any article or anything related to the hoof, everywhere, nobody talks about feeding the hoof. They talk about angles. They talk about uh, what shoe to put on and for this condition. Uh, they talk about the flat feet of thoroughbreds. They, they go on, they say it's genetic. If they're trying to fix quarter cracks or uh, toe cracks, they've got all sorts of braces. They can drill, they can lace it all together. But nobody's talking about the need to get this sulfur amino acid in there to hold this foot together. Because cysteine, again, makes up 24% of the hoof. And without that 24% in there, if it's like 10% or 15%, it's just not going to be strong enough and the hoof will fall apart. So let's move into one final discussion before we end this. And that is simply, okay, why is a horse so protein deficient? Well, in my past podcast, we've talked about metabolic syndrome. We talked about insulin resistance. We talked about glucose being converted into uh, fat and being stored in the fat cell. And I also told you the brain needs glucose to operate. So to get glucose, the brain will tell the liver to convert every amino acid, which is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, maybe sulfur, but let's just use carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. It cleaves off the nitrogen and turns the amino acid into carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, glucose. That's called gluconeogenesis. So the protein is being self-digested and converted into glucose because the brain says, look, I don't care if the muscles go away and we completely fall apart, but the brain has to work to the very end. So we're going to get glucose any way we can. So they break down the proteins. And since we've been feeding excess sugar in our diets, our diets, our horses' diets, 
since easily the 1970s and through the 80s and 90s, suddenly we're getting all these protein deficient uh, illnesses. As an equine dentist, I'm seeing uh, fractured teeth, wasn't in the textbooks in the 1980s. Uh, you guys have seen drop fetlocks, not in the textbooks in the 1980s. Kissing spine disease, not in the textbooks in the 1980s. Um, so the suspensories, it's an epidemic now, shouldn't be. Not in the textbooks, and well, there's in the textbooks, but it wasn't a big deal, but it's an epidemic now. We've got narcolepsy in all these horses. Is this something new? I mean, we hardly ever heard of narcolepsy in the 1980s. And now we hear it all the time. They're studying it like crazy. That's where the horse just suddenly collapses and falls asleep. Where's that coming from? Cushing's. I mean, I understand that we had um, insulin resistance in some horses and especially ponies, and they're all obese. But in horses, we didn't have laminitis. We didn't have a lot of this stuff. Now we have laminitis in horses all the time. We're getting um, Cushing's disease. It's, it's just the disease du jour, you know, the disease of the day. Everybody's got Cushing's. They've got uh, bad hooves. They've got horses that at 10 to 12 to 14 have some sort of lameness that they're out of competition. Why? And from my perspective, all I'm seeing is the um, high use of glucose, starch in our foods that's competing and causing the brain to convert protein into um, sugars, plus the monograss of our pastures, the monograss of our hay, and hay being fed during the summer when they have pasture to increase the amount of sugar that's going into them so that you have more gluconeogenesis. So you have increased use of, of protein and amino acids, you have decreased in, intake of good high quality protein, and you have horses that are suffering. It's that simple. It doesn't cost you anything but a bag of soybean meal and your hay or your pasture that you're feeding them. You don't need any other supplements because once the proteins start to work, most of the illnesses and diseases go away. The gut bacteria start to settle down. And this isn't true for every horse, but a vast vast majority of horses that get rid of grain and switch over to protein are so happy. They see so many benefits. So that's my little ditty. I've spent about an hour uh, cramming protein into your brain. Uh, don't be afraid of it. Uh, the one study that showed uh, protein causing kidney damage was done on rabbits that were fed uh, bone broth. You know, when does a rabbit get bone broth? You know, I don't know. But that's what I found. That's what my research has found. There's no known kidney failure from a horse. If your horse has kidney failure already from some other element that's going on in its life, yes, you're going to have to watch the protein. Again, you need to talk to your veterinarian and work through these things. But these are exceptions to the rules. Most horses are starving for this protein. If they get the protein levels up, then the, uh, this hypothesis called the protein leverage hypothesis is met. And this has been proven in humans where we constantly are looking for food until our protein levels are met for the day. And once that does, we become satiated. And I've been able to see this in minis with muzzles and ponies that are, have to be have limited turnout. As they get rid of their sugar, they convert over to using body fat for fuel and they start to uh, get their protein intake up to snuff. These horses are no longer food aggressive. They're no longer starving. They no longer are craving food. Uh, they find that they're being satiated and they lose their body fat, they gain their muscle, and they have a really good, happy life. So that's it about proteins. Uh, it's not that complicated. We just aren't feeding them enough good quality protein because we've cap captured them behind a fence line and feed them artificial foods. And in addition, the artificial foods are causing increased uh, sugar intake, which is causing them to consume their proteins more. And if you have soft tissue injuries or you want to prevent it, if you want hooves to start to look better, uh, it is a process that takes up to two years to do in some horses. And if they're too old, if they're 30 plus, you may never see any difference. The 20 to 30 year olds, maybe half of them will start to look better. And the younger horses, especially if you start them off right in the, when they're young, you'll be amazed how well these horses do. All right, that's it. Hopefully I haven't uh, bored you to tears. Hopefully this makes sense to you. And uh, I think we're pretty much covered all the ins and outs of nutrition. I need to start talking about something else, but um, 
I'll I'll wait for you to, to listen. And by the way, uh, if you go to the horsesadvocate.com, please become a member uh, that helps provide um, all the things that are necessary to keep this podcast going and all the other things that are going on in my life in the Horses Advocate. Uh, I'm now posting the videos on the podcast page so you can see this if you want. You can uh, find all the videos and any links to any uh, information that I feel is important. Otherwise, just keep listening and comment. You can comment there too. All right. Thanks and appreciate all of you for being here. Doc T out. Hey, everyone. Doc T here. Thank you for listening to my content. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you please subscribe, comment, like, thumbs up, and give a star review? However it's presented to you, I want you to do that. There are two reasons. The first, of course, is to improve this product. This way I know what you like, what you don't like, what I can improve upon, what topics you want me to cover. But more importantly, it's also going to help others find me. And by doing that, you are now engaged in this mission of helping horses thrive in a human world. By you helping, we can reach others. And that I would be so grateful for. And remember, go to thehorsesadvocate.com for updates on this information. Thehorsesadvocate.com. And again, thank you so much for being here. Talk to you out.